third day of the school. So as usual in the morning session, we will have uh, two lectures with a half hour break, and then there will be the informal discussion. And uh, so we can start with uh, Julian's course on chaos, please. Okay, so good morning. Um, as you, of course, have heard, this is the last lecture in this series of, of lectures. And so I'm going to be here uh, all of today, but I'm going not to be here for the rest of the school. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask in private, uh, you should try and catch me today. I'll be happy to talk, of course. Okay, so this last lecture, um, I, I called it the chaos bootstrap, but that's only going to be the last uh, half of it. So let me say, so let's talk about something that we call ETH matrix models. And finally, um, chaos bootstrap. Um, but to set up the, the lecture, I want to give you a different perspective on some of the things that we've already encountered, um, and a perspective that is actually uh, quite old. So this is a way of understanding how matrices build space-time. And I'm still going to restrict on two dimensions, and we will build our way to three dimensions and perhaps higher um, using similar ideas uh, in this last part. <coughs> so this, uh, this is uh, ideas that um, happened in the 80s, uh, I think associated with names like Kazakov, Gross, Migdal, um, Moore, but there is a very nice, uh, Douglas Moore, there is a nice review by Moore and Ginsburg, or Ginsburg and Moore, I guess, which also I will um, supply to the organizers to put on the website. Um, so uh, the point here is that um, one way of, of, of constructing what should be the path integral of two-dimensional gravity Uh, including a sum of topologies, okay? One way of defining this is by actually starting with a matrix model. So it's, it is going to be a certain limit of a matrix model, so I'm going to integrate over uh, a distribution of matrices, so something that we would have called a random matrix. Um, and I'm going to give this uh, some potential trace V of M, um, and what I'm, this limit, I will have to describe a little bit, but people refer to this as a double scaling limit. So roughly speaking, if M, so M, M would be, uh, let's say an N by N uh, random matrix, Okay, and it is random in the sense that I've specified a distribution of matrices from which I am sampling. Um, and uh, there is going to be some, some coupling parameters. And in particular, there will be some, some um, for example, cubic coupling, G3 coupling. Uh, I will write down uh, an example of such a potential. And so this double scaling limit will take n, the size of the matrix, to infinity, and at the same time scale uh, some, um, some appropriate coupling to a critical value. And the idea of this double scaling limit, and I will uh, explain this in a, in a second, is that it in some sense produces a continuum version of a two-dimensional geometry, and the matrix integral um, will then implement something like this path angle in the sum of a topology. So for example, um, e.g. V of this matrix uh, could be, um, um, well, oh, trace V of M could be something like trace one half M squared plus trace, well, G, o, G3 uh, trace m cubed, maybe divided by three. But you could have other uh, polynomials here. 
and they equally make sense. So now the idea is, uh, is the following. So you start by looking at Feynman diagrams of such models. G3 uh, G3 star will be some critical coupling. Well, G3 is the coupling um, that uh, appears in the matrix model, and G3 star is a particular value of that coupling which tunes this model to a critical point. No, you have to take them at the same time. This is why they call it double scaling. So uh, as you take the number, at the size of the matrix to infinity, you take the, the coupling constant to a critical value. You have to do this in a coordinated way, such that um, a, a certain fine, a ratio of, of uh, a combination of these quantities remains finite in this double scaling limit. But I, I will write a little bit more on that. So, so the Feynman diagrams of this of such a model in a Toft double line notation. Okay, they will consist of things like a uh, propagator, which uh, just comes from the quadratic term, i, i primed, j, j primed, and it will be some delta i, i primed, delta j, j primed. Okay, and the idea is that every matrix, of course, has two indices, so like I, I write like M, I, J, and so this is like a propagator um, between matrices and the indices run like this, and I have to identify them in this way. And then in this cubic case, I have vertices, which basically are um, where three of these lines meet uh, in a triangle, and I have something like I, J, uh, sorry, J, K, K. I, and this will be the vertex with strength G, G3. But the point I want to make is not to calculate uh, individual diagrams, but to point out that um, using this Toft counting, um, or using, using these ideas, di these diagrams can be classified by topology, meaning in this case, again, the Euler character, okay? And at the level of, of drawings, you might get things like, um, let's say you contribute, uh, you, you, want to, you, you, you want to compute things like um, all geometries, all diagrams that have one boundary, so then the, the leading order topology will be something like the disk. So like we had yesterday, so there's a boundary and this is like just the surface of this, okay? So this is really one way as we did yesterday. The disk plus uh, actually it turns out subleading in this N, you will have some diagram which is uh, the disk with the handle and so on. But the point that I want to make is that if you look at an individual diagram in each of these uh, topological uh, sectors, then um, the point is that they will be made up of um, a bunch of these double lines which meet at these uh, cubic vertices. So um, I hope I can draw this a little bit. So one example might be something like this, cubic lines, okay, etc. cetera. Um, okay. Um, let's say, and so on. And uh, the, so, so, so this surface here just represents the topology of this diagram. But what I want to point out is that you can actually uh, convince yourself that if you um, take something like, um, maybe I want to continue this up here, not to be in the way, uh, to some sort of like um, dual graph of this. So you, you know, triangulate basically this discrete graph here, what you find is that um, the, the matrix model graphs define a discrete triangulation of this surface. OK, 
okay, which I have, which I have drawn uh, in red. And of course, the idea would be that also locally, if you look here, you have the, sa you have the, same, you have the same sort of idea that you, know, you actually draw a bunch of triangles that make the surface. But of course, here you have to take into account the topology. So I don't want to draw the global picture. But you have the same thing that all of the Feynman diagrams uh, of this matrix model, which are in this topological sector, define a discrete triangulation of uh, now surfaces that have a topology with one genus and here one boundary. This, this is just one example, by the way. And the power of n um, is also uh, related to the Euler character. The relative power of n is related to the Euler character. So in a, in a, um, in a standard n to infinite limit, you get only the planar contributions. Um, any planar limit, you get uh, the leading diagrams will be the ones of the simplest topology, which will have the least suppression in terms of the 1 over n powers. Um, and that's a topological statement here. But what the idea is of this double scaling limit is to actually look at a slightly different, um, a slightly different uh, a way of, of making the size of this matrix big. Um, and the point is that um, this double scaling limit okay so it uh, it, um, it, 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 it it tries to get a continuum limit of the uh, discrete approximation Um, and retains uh, coherent contributions of the non-trivial topologies. Okay, and so roughly speaking, again, the um, the mathematical or the physical idea behind this is that if you only uh, take into account, if if you find a limit which takes into account graphs um, where the number of triangles goes to infinity while you can scale the area per triangle to zero, so to retain a finite limit of the total area, then this triangulation with curvature concentrated on the edges gives you a continuum metric, and moreover, you retain the fact that you have summed over topologies. Okay, now um, this, in other words, uh, so what you do is then, you, you take this double scaling limit, and it means in this case, something like, as I said, n goes to infinity, uh, G3 goes to G3 critical such that N divided by uh, G3 minus G3, I call it star, to some appropriate power, which depends on critical exponents, um, is finite. And this is what you might call, in our previous language, E to the S0. Okay? So that you end up getting a continuous theory of two-dimensional Euclidean geometries where subsequent powers in topology, you work this out, are suppressed by this topology counting parameter e to the s0. But e to the s0 is something that came from scaling two parameters um, um, to infinity in such a way that uh, their, uh, that their uh, uh, quotient remains finite. And so um, what I want to say here is that this is a different way of sort of associating matrices with geometry or quantum geometry. But here M is a mathematical device. OK, this is nothing but, um, this is nothing but um, a clever way of uh, of, of constructing, if you want, uh, this pathological. And I encourage you to read this very beautiful review, um, 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 which, which does a great job and also a better job at drawing these diagrams um, in a computer-aided way. But Barry, what, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. So what happens if you go away from the scaling limits on the left-hand side of the equation? Um, but you don't have these parameters on the left-hand side.
I mean, I'm defining the, this by the limit of the right-hand side. You are supposed to reproduce a path integral over 2D gravities for any potential V. I mean, it does, is it important? Um, well, that, that's, that's a, a good point. So first of all, um, so there is some sort of universality here because you tune these potentials to critical points. And so there is a certain class of behaviors uh, um, that, that comes out, which is not, um, well, it depends, I think, on the power uh, P that you retain here, and it has to do with the kind of gravitational theory then you, uh, you, you recover in the continuum limit. But one of the aims of the game today will be uh, that, well, we will change the perspective, which is what I want to say here, is that um, what we have seen in some sense already is a new perspective, namely that M is actually a physical thing. M is H, uh, has to do with the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian of a quantum chaotic system. Okay, and we have already seen this explicitly uh, for, um, for the case of JT gravity, right? In the sense that, uh, well, I, okay, I, I sort of showed you this somewhat indirectly, but one way of, of interpreting the work of, of uh, SSS of Sarchenker and Stanford is they uh, wrote down a matrix model for JT gravity but this matrix model, you really integrate over the Hamiltonian. We call it the boundary Hamiltonian, but um, let's just say you integrate over a Hamiltonian. So M no longer <coughs> is just, is no longer a, a device that allows us through this um, very beautiful story uh, to uh, construct a path integral via a, a continuum limit of some discrete triangular, the triangulization but um, it actually has some, some, some meaning in terms of a physical Hamiltonian and of a quantum chaotic system. So in, in, that, in that sense, um, also together with what we've seen in these lectures so far, it's true that on, on the level of a slogan, it's true that these sort of um, quantum, uh, we call may, maybe level statistics or level correlations, okay? Uh, build up space time. Okay? And that's a sort of a, a philosophical um, perspective on this. But um, what I would like to do is now, um, I would like to uh, take the opposite route in some sense, and I would like to try to build up models of uh, chaotic systems whose level correlations build up space-time, um, and that perhaps allow us to go beyond some of the uh, models that have been studied, as I said, since the 80s. And in particular, um, I want to, I will show you how to get some story that um, looks a lot like this, but uh, in two-dimensional CFTs related to three-dimensional gravity. Oh, and I should say um, that uh, this, this is related to work which I already uh, mentioned with um, Kolschmeier, uh, Muhammad Zanov, uh, sorry, Jeffress has an alphabetically preferred name, and myself, as well as work with Alex Berlin, uh, Jan de Boer, uh, um, Daniel Jaffris, <laughs> uh, Pranjal Nayak, and myself. Okay, so um, firstly, I want to get back to this idea of um, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, 
We're going to use now the insights that we have from random matrix theory uh, in the chaotic sense uh, and uh, from um, quantum chaos in the ETH sense to build up matrix models which go beyond uh, uh, these kind of ideas in, in ways that you will see. Now the obvious joke, of course, with this, with this kind of stuff is that if you ever get approached again at a party by someone who says, oh, you work in theoretical physics, I have this idea that we live in the matrix, and you can say, yes, <laughs> we do. Well, if we live in 2D or 3D. But, uh, yeah. So in this new perspective, uh, uh, the planar limit means that you are taking the dimension of Dilbert space to, to infinite. Um, I mean, I'm not taking the planar limit. I'm taking this double scaling limit. Okay, but in, in particular, and, and going to infinity means that uh, you are including all the energy levels. Um, yeah, that's okay. That, that's a good point. So this double scaling limit is something slightly <coughs> sneaky, I would say. So what, what it really means is that you go and you, you write down a theory which takes into account only levels which come from the edge of the spectrum. But um, so what you need to do is you need to scale the energies to be um, very close to the edge of the spectrum, but you also want to work in a limit such that you retain an infinite number of energy levels close to the spectrum. But then in the, in the actual double scaling limit, the coupling that you get, this coupling here, e to the s0, remains finite. And from the perspective that we had previously developed, this was counting effectively the dimension of our Hilbert space. So um, I would say effectively you end up with a system that behaves as if it had a finite Hilbert space that includes also all these non-trivial topological corrections. But I, I think that what you point out is that it's in, not intuitive, a little bit subtle to see how that works if you just were staring at your matrix because I agree that you take the, the, the size of it to infinity. Yeah. General relativity, uh, this is a statement mass and energy in general relativity, uh, look at your globally uh, build up space times and in the JT machinery, quantum level uh, correlations build up space times. Can I compare this to? So first of all, I would say that that's one, that is one uh, <coughs> um, interesting interpretation of the work of SSS. So they wrote down uh, a double, well, they wrote down Again, I said this before, they never wrote down the matrix model, and that's partly, by the way, because of this double scaling. It's very inconvenient to write down a potential directly in this double scale limit. So they, they uh, skirted that issue by writing down these uh, recursion relations and pointing out that the JT recursion relations and the matrix model recursion relations are the same. But just because uh, of some technological necessity, uh, as part of this work, um, we actually wrote down um, a non-double scaled matrix model um, which has admittedly a rather ugly potential and we defined a, a double scaling limit which, which recovers the, the physics of the SSS model. So, so to, to say it, um, so, so having said that, um, I think that in the JT case there is an exact story where we can think of it that way, and because uh, the Hamiltonian, the matrix that comes up here is a Hamiltonian, uh, I would say that this is an exactly, is a, is a true statement in JT gravity, okay? There is another question. Uh, so this vertices will have different, will correspond to different diagrams depending upon how I, how I contract them? Yeah, yeah, but you sum over all diagrams. And the point is that by summing over all diagrams, however, uh, so, so, so let, okay, let's, let's just say it first. Um, so you sum over all diagrams, and each diagram is sort of like a different metric, if you want, uh, in a given topological class. It's a discrete version. It's a discrete version of a metric. 
So by summing over all diagrams, you are performing an, a sum over uh, the different metrics that you can put on the surface. Now, uh, this double scaling limit, again, um, does it in such a way that what you retain are diagrams that, that all are continuously, so this, this becomes infinitely fine, this mesh, and you, but then you still sum over all diagrams in this class, right, with infinite number of vertices. And uh, so that becomes uh, an integral over all the metrics that you can put on the surface. So that's precisely part of the idea, if you want. I don't know, actually. Do you? OK. OK. Uh, so, um, so what you wrote before is like a larger end limit on the right and uh, some path integral with a metric on it on the mm -hmm. left. So is this larger end limit related to the larger end limit that you have in the holographic correspondence? Um, um, <clears throat> I mean, I want to say yes, but um, um, it's not completely obvious, uh, to be honest with you. Um, um, because you can also take Toft limits, <coughs> which are more obviously this thing that you do in, um, in holography. So I'm not sure it's, uh, it, it's, it's so clear that you should, you should say it like this. But uh, um, the fact that you take large n uh, that you sort of have a large local number of degrees of freedom is, I think, in the same spirit. Um, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, to the extent that we can think of uh, JT and, and its uh, SSS dual as a holographic duality, I mean, so in that context, it's exactly the holographic limit that you take. Okay, but in higher dimensions, um, I don't, I don't want to make such statements. Okay, but let's, 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 get, let's crack on a bit. So, um, uh, so I want to now actually define these ETH matrix models. And random geometry. Okay, so um, the first thing that um, we need to do is we need to uh, now revisit this, this ETH ANSATS, and maybe I'll remind you of it. So what we had was we had I, O, J, and this was going to be, was supposed to be equal to, or this is equal to some um, smooth function of the average energy of the eigenstates I and J plus a fluctuation contribution F. E omega rij. And rij, I was saying, is a random matrix. And in many treatments of ETH, you will see the statement that this matrix should be Gaussian. But in fact, um, it is easy uh, to, to, say, to see, or it may, maybe not easy to see, but in hindsight, it is clear that rij um, should be a non-Gaussian distributed random matrix. Okay, so, um, um, and this actually, I should say, again, um, we argue in some of these papers, but it's also related to a very nice way of thinking about ETH, which has come up in recent years in the statistical physics community, and in particular, uh, the Paris group of Funi and Korchan um, and uh, various collaborators, for example, Silvia Papalardi comes to mind. Um, they have actually worked out a story 
that is uh, largely equivalent to what I'm going to tell you about, but they, they use a very different perspective. They don't use the perspective of these ETH matrix models. But um, they sh show this very nice hierarchy of non-Gaussian corrections to this RIJ. So, um, so one thing is that, for example, um, if, you, if you had only random matrices of Gaussian uh, statistics, then something like um, O of T, O, O of T, O, so it calculated using ETH, so something like an out-of-time order correlation function, okay, would always factorize. exactly into two-point functions immediately. And that uh, cannot be uh, possible because it's in direct contradiction, um, is in contradiction with having a non-trivial Lyapunov exponent. With this idea that you have a non-zero uh, quantum Lyapunov exponent, because the quantum Lyapunov exponent comes precisely from the connected contribution to the four-point out-of-time order correlation function. So it factorizes, it has no connected contribution, so it would never be able to describe something like Lyapunov behavior. So just to tie it back to um, um, something I said in the beginning. In general, however, uh, this factorization um, leads to many uh, sort of contradictions with obviously uh, uh, necessary physical requirements. For example, one way uh, that we have seen the necessity also to add uh, uh, the uh, 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 non-Gaussian parts of the statistics is that when we first, actually the first, the first project that we set ourselves here was to add an actual couple matter field to JT gravity and see if we can write down a matrix model description of the same spirit as SSS. And what you find is that if you just retain the Gaussian statistics of this matrix, then um, the uh, four-point functions of that theory will not be crossing invariant, which is in direct contradiction with the gravity theory. So if you just take JT plus a matter field, tells you. So for example, it also contradicts things like crossing relations. In, let's say, ADS CFT type matrix models. Okay. And uh, I will get back to this um, toward the end of the lecture and we will look at this in much more detail. But for example, in order to, um, in order to, uh, in order to address this OTOC thing, you can say that there should be a connected contraction um, of these R matrices, which of the form R, I, J, R, J, K, uh, R, K, L, R, L, I, connected, okay, which is uh, suppressed with three powers of this macrocanonical entropy, which is now at the average of four energies, so you have an energy one associated to this, energy two associated to this, three and four associated here, times some continuous function G4 of those four energies. Okay, and if you uh, add this, you can show that, for example, this function G4 encodes uh, the Lyapunov exponent of the theory. Okay, so now um, two, two remarks. One remark is that this function G4 is actually just a generalization to, if you want, four-point matrix elements of this F. F, even though I've written it here as a one-point function, I've already said it before, F is sort of like the fluctuation. F times Rij is the fluctuation. So it pertains really to two-point functions. And this guy pertains to four-point functions. And in fact, um, as I said, uh, Fouini and Kurchan have written down a whole hierarchy um, 
Um, and uh, in, in our way, so have we, as you, as you shall see, um, which basically generalizes this to higher point moments. So in other words, you define higher moments of the distribution of R by feeding some data in the theory, such as, for example, the fact that it has non-trivial Lyapunov behavior or that it satisfies crossing relations, etc. So the other comment is that this is seemingly highly suppressed, but in fact, uh, it still contributes at order one to correlation functions. And the reason is that whenever uh, you use this in a correlation function in a meaningful way, so for example, in the four-point four OTO, you actually have to sum over the Hilbert space many times. And in fact, you always have to sum enough times such that you just undo this factor because you know every e to the minus s sub is sort of worth one sum over the Hilbert space. So in general, you can actually say that if you were to do something like an endpoint connected correlation, okay, this should be something like e to the minus n minus 1 s of the average entropy times some smooth function gn of the n arguments. So, um, so in other words, uh, so one could say from, from this energy perspective, if you work in the energy basis, then ETH gets corrected, or the Gaussian ETH gets corrected by very small non-Gaussian corrections that are more and more increasingly small in the entropy. But in fact, from a physical perspective, they contribute to correlation functions of physical interest at leading order. So this is the sense which you might say that it's actually strongly non-Gaussian. So this structure here, yeah. This uh, G4, for example, encodes the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, was the converse true? Did the Lyapunov exponent imply exactly what G4 should be? No, I don't think that's true, but what it does do is it, it gives you, well, there are, there are arguments, for example, for this bound on the Lyapunov exponent um, that come from um, sort of common sense bounds on this G4, um, but you could also turn that around saying that the bound of the Lyapunov exponent would imply some common sense bounds of this G4, but the statement that it's fully determined I think is incorrect. And in fact, um, that, that's, a general, that's a general thing that we will need to face, which is that e even when we talk about ETH, right, this is a statement which is to some extent kinematic. We don't specify what the function F is or what the function O is. That's supposed to be theory specific. That's fine because this is a generally still a predictive framework. It predicts thermalization to whatever the thermal value will be, and then there'll be fluctuation relations with whatever the two-point function is. So from a statistical mechanics point of view, that is fine. But from our perspective now, we would like to have a way of determining what these functions should be because they actually determine our matrix model. And that's something where I need to input uh, some more ideas uh, bef before, before we get there. Okay, so um, just to, just to um, s finish it up, so this, uh, this structure here is something that people refer to uh, as extended, well, uh, we and others, as extended or generalized ETH. And uh, I think uh, there is one person who d deserves to be mentioned here. So th I think the first time that this was announced was in a paper um, with my former graduate student, Manuel Vielma. But as I said, um, I think there is a very beautiful uh, systematic work also by this group um, on this hierarchy. So, right, so now, um, let me see. Um, uh, okay. So, 
Okay, so the point is now that um, one, further, one further point is that um, we, one can package this this information as well as the information on the spectrum in a two matrix model. And this is what uh, um, we would like to call something like an ETH matrix model. So, so you have something like this, ETH, which will be now the integral over a random matrix H and a second random matrix, which should be this matrix O, but we can rescale things and maybe by abuse of notation, we, 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 can, we can call this second random matrix O. Um, that's, of course, with eye on sort of the holographic application because we always like to call operators O. Um, so we have one random matrix that takes care of the spectrum. That's the H-type random matrix. And we have one random matrix which, will take, which takes care of the matrix elements of uh, an operator. And um, uh, we have some, some measure for dh and do. Um, so we could, for example, a priori put a flat measure here and then just say that the details are uh, uh, in a potential of h and o, which is uh, a single trace potential that is made up of words of h and o. And if you go to the energy basis, so you diagonalize the matrix h, um, you get uh, essentially a, a potential which has functions of energies, okay, integrated over the probability distribution of energies where it's implied by the H integral, and the DO with its non Gaussianities implies uh, uh, this hierarchy of, of, of correlations. Okay, so this ETH matrix model, it uh, encodes exactly the same information as this hierarchy of, 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 of let's say, ETH functions, okay? Um, but it encodes them in terms of a spectral integral and an integral over what stands in for uh, the ETH uh, hierarchy of correlation functions. So this is just a different way of packaging the information, um, and um, it becomes, in this case, a two-matrix model, okay? And what is interesting, something that we haven't explored much, but um, let's say you wanted to, for example, study this case for a number of operators, then this will become a multi-matrix model. And those things in their interpretation as generating a probability distribution for matrix elements of uh, uh, O and O's and H, they also are related to what mathematicians call free probability theory. Okay, but what I want to spend um, now the remaining time on um, is really the question is, so, so that, let, let me just say that this part now of, of this lecture, you should view as, um, something in statistical physics in the same spirit as ETH, which, as I said, on the very generic condition, captures the physics of quantum chaotic thermalizing systems. But it is intentionally also widely open. It doesn't specify exactly the theory that we're working with. I mean, that is also a feature, not a bug. This is like a framework, not a single theory. But um, I promised you that we get back to some um, holography and in particular higher dimensional uh, versions that will connect to this uh, um, quantum level correlations build up space time. So the question that I want to answer now is um, what determines this potential? I mean beyond, beyond as I said this overall framework because there is you know we, we've determined the general structure of the potential but we don't know what are actually these functions that go in there, and so on and so forth. So, um, so the question is, um, how to determine the potential? Uh, 
Okay. And so here, um, well, um, I'd like to go almost directly to the 3D case, but I do want to make the statement. So, um, one thing that uh, one can do is, so one example is this uh, JT plus matter. So in the sense that you actually couple another matter field, which is not the dilaton, d phi squared, let's say plus m squared, phi squared. So this gives you some kind of JT plus matter um, two matrix model. And uh, I, well, I will obviously uh, supply this reference on the website. Um, there's, a, there's a fairly long uh, literature on this. Um, and what we do is basically we implement, we, we determine the potential by implementing certain constraints which determine the potential V in terms of something that's called the 6J symbol. And the 6J symbol will come up now as well in higher dimensions, so I just uh, wanted to, to point that out and point you towards this paper. And of course, so as, I, as I said, I'm around, so if you want to know more about this, you can also ask me. But, um, so let me go directly to the case uh, of ADS3. So let me talk about something that actually um, is, a, is a tensor model. I mean, it's a random multi-indexed object. Okay, so um, a tensor model for random two-dimensional CFT and therefore 3D gravity um, and that's also, you know, because we're not going to talk about actual CFDs. This is sort of uh, um, this is sort of a uh, idea of how to implement a chaotic version of the bootstrap. So, um, so, so one of so now I also want to make, give you some physical perspective on this, perhaps from from a holographic uh, perspective. So the the idea is that. Um, you know, we have this immensely complicated Hilbert space that describes the black hole, which we have seen is exponentially dense. Um, however, uh, a semi-classical observer doesn't see it, doesn't see the details of this Hilbert space. So, however, in quantum uh, chaotic systems, as we have argued many times, you know, um, it's as if this kind of uh, set of states behaves like a random, uh, like a random distribution. So the thing is that we do is, so we, let's say, um, semi-classical observer that don't have access the details of the black hole microstates. But they have access to some information. So what you can do is you can fix everything that you know. So fix, fix the low energy data that you know. So, for example, dimensions of low-lying operators. And then average over everything else. But subject to, of course, to constraints which we have basically assembled in terms of what I would have, what, what I would have now called, you know, chaos universality. 
And now also we, we will put in things like, um, so because we describe a CFT, we will put in something like crossing symmetry. Don't worry, I will write some equations for this. Okay. Um, crossing symmetry, uh, so for example, modular crossing, let's say, and four point crossing on the sphere. A generalization to CFT of this v where sort of the maximum ignorance distributions that were compatible with what you know about the system. Namely, for example, it is a Hermitian Hamiltonian that has time reversal invariance. All other information, so then you get out the Wigner distributions. The outland Sternbauer distributions you can get by putting in more, uh, you know, about discrete symmetries. Now the question is, how would you do that with a CFT, namely uh, a theory that, that has interesting symmetry constraints that relate different parts of the spectrum? It can't just be a completely random matrix. So what we write down is we basically will write down a probability distribution on the data of a CFT subject to what we know, namely some low energy data, chaos universality, and then these non-trivial Virasoro crossing constraints. And what will remain will be a very interesting model, which is like a random tensor model, uh, but of course that's in the same spirit as a random matrix model, um, which will have an interesting interpretation. And it's, it's going to be, of course, uh, of this type, right? I wouldn't have bothered uh, saying this before. So that's a bit of philosophy. So now let me try um, and write some equations, I put down some equations to see. So, um, yeah, I guess I have a bit more time. Um, <clears throat> so you see, so a CFT um, a CFT uh, is related to the set of conformal dimensions delta and the OPE coefficients C, I, J, K, which are basically three-point functions. So these are the operator dimensions. These are the, the conformal dimensions. And these are the OPE coefficients and they're basically three-point functions. Okay. By the way, a three-point function defines a triangle. Now, of course, the, these are the eigenvalues, so maybe we just should think of them as the eigenvalues of the dilation operator. And then what we have is we have uh, a matrix, and we have a tensor. However, this data doesn't define a good CFT unless uh, it satisfies uh, further constraints. Okay? And so those constraints, uh, so, so this, um, um, this is what one would refer to as CFT data. Okay? And now, um, Again, um, to, to uh, pay homage to people who also have thought about this, the idea of treating all or some of this CFT data as random objects, um, well, it has, I think, first really been announced by Debour, uh, by Bellin and Debour. Yes, I think again alphabetically, yep. Um, and also uh, by Chandra Collier, uh, Maloney and Hartman. Okay. Um, but what I'm what I'm uh, about to say here uh, um, is, you know, a different perspective, and of course goes uh, goes beyond what has been described in these papers. 
So, um, so this is CFT data, but CFT data becomes a real CFT once you imp uh, imply, once you impose bootstrap constraints. The problem uh, is in this program of, of defining averages is that uh, typically CFTs, if you just have an exact CFT, uh, you, they don't allow, they're, they're very rigid objects, they don't allow to just uh, average over a large space of just CFTs, even if you want to do so. They don't have like a large manifold, typically of, of say marginal directions that preserve CFT invariants that you can integrate over. Sorry, can so I have a... what you can do instead is you can integrate over this ensemble of data subject to certain constraints which, which we'll write down. Yeah. yeah. I had a <coughs> Sorry, I had a question. Um, so I guess in the second point, what you also want to say is that the CFT actually has an OPE, no? Because if it sure. really, yeah, okay. But so if I, uh, is it obvious that if I make these things random that an OPE should exist in the first place? Because if I now start, making some gigantic OPE with a huge sum over a huge amount of random things, I could imagine that things get more complicated. No? Um, yeah, I think that such, uh, so what actually is the status of an individual member of this ensemble is very much an open question. So for example, they will not be CFTs, but they will be approximately CFTs. Now the question, um, that uh, one would ask then, do they sort of approximately have a, an OPE, okay? What might be even more uh, uh, scary in some sense, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it because you will see that the model that we uh, get uh, in the end just looks so nice, kind of must be right. But if you ask what is the individual member, like is it even a quantum field theory? Because a quantum field theory, you know, is something that has like locality properties. You can write it down in terms of uh, 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 Lagrangian density and I mean all the things that we learned from Weinberg's book, for example. But um, the fact that the CFT data plus the existence of an OPE plus the bootstrap gives you actually a well-defined quantum field theory is a very non-trivial fact. And I don't know if this is true if, if the data only satisfies these constraints uh, approximately, like uh, so, yeah. So those are th those are very deep questions. I think that would be certainly interesting to uh, to to investigate. So this this of course uh, opens a lot of these interesting questions to investigate. But yes, so the, so the individual element of this ensemble uh, is an object that we should be um, that we should scrutinize heavily. But let me now write down. Um, this ensemble, and again, let's try and let's try and be be charmed by the answer, and maybe close our eyes in the middle a little bit, or say this opens very interesting questions which we need to which we need to further investigate. So let me let me actually focus on one of these bootstrap constraints, in particular the crossing constraints that comes from Virasoro. So what we're going to do is we're going to write some local crossing constraint. So um, the crossing equation I'm thinking of is something like um, you take C I1, I2, P, C star, I3, I4, P, times a conformal block P of Z, F tilde P of Z. So um, let me first write the equation. And this uh, is the expansion. So this is the S channel expansion uh, of a four point function where I'm fusing operators, let's say like this, summing over P um, one, two, three, four, um, propagating the 
uh, the, the block P here, and Z is the cross ratio. Z is the cross ratio. Conformal cross ratio. And then this should be the same as uh, the expansion in the other channel, which is if I fuse I1 with I3 and I2 with I4, and I contract into the crossed uh, Virasoro block F Q1 minus Z. And this would be this fusion, sum of a Q, one, two, three, four. Q propagates here. So this should be this, and that's the famous bootstrap equation. And um, F of P Z is the S channel um, Virasoro block. And F, actually we could put an S here, and FT of Q1 minus Z is the T channel version of it. Okay, and we could, um, we could have written S, S, and T, T here. So this equation has to be satisfied um, for the set of conformal dimensions delta and OPE coefficients here that you, uh, OPE coefficients uh, Cijk that define a, a true CFT. Now, let's do the following, okay? Well, no, first of all, let's, let's, let's do one manipulation on this equation. Okay, I, I probably will need about 10 more minutes, is that okay? Okay, so, um, so, so what we're, going, what we're going to do is we're going to use this so-called inversion formula of Ponceau and Teschner. So, um, uh, and Teschner inversion. Namely, that I can write the T-channel block P1 minus C as a linear superposition of the, um, of the S channel block and the thing that goes in here is this, this, this famous inversion kernel, so P, T, P, S. Um, and P, T, P, S, okay, these are sort of P, T, P, S, um, uh, is related to the conformal dimension, conformal dimension of, of the operators. And um, what I'm using here is what people call, because in this business people use this so-called Liouville notation. Okay, so there's some parameterization of what are the conformal dimensions and so on and so forth. But you can but write just this. a technical question. Yeah. This FS and FT are the same functions, right? Or no? Um, uh, they are the same functions, but the things that you sum over are not the same. So what this does is it tells you what are the S channel um, states that you need to sum over in order to get a given T channel conformal block, but evaluated, of course, at one minus z. Yeah, yeah. But so the uh, arguments are different, but yeah. and the functions the same. Yeah, functions are the same, right? Okay. Yeah. okay. So then, um, what we can do is we can write. What we can do is we can write. Uh, the crossing equation basically as the equation zero should be equal to the sum of uh, ci1, ci2, p, c star, i3, i4, p. Um, actually, let me call it q. Delta pq minus Delta P, what did I call it here? Okay, let me, minus PS. 
minus, and I'm summing over Q only, C I uh, one I four Q, C star um, I two I three Q times, and now we actually have to take the holomorphic square of this S Q. And the holomorphic square, because we have to invert the block and its, and its conjugate. And this thing here is a famous object. It's a 6J symbol of Virasoro. So this depends on S, Q. And in fact, I didn't write this, but it also depends on I, um, I1, I2, I3, I4. I didn't write this because I didn't want to put the labels everywhere. Okay, and uh, by the way, this is also maybe in response to your question, right? The block also depends on the external states. So this should be labeled by I1, I3, I2, I4. And th this one should be labeled in the same order now, but, but I, I1, I2, I3, I4, colon wise. Okay? And so this inversion kernel also depended always on I1, I2, I3, I4 here. But if I write so many indices, um, yeah, it starts getting a bit annoying. But this is what is called the 6J symbol of Virasoro. Or if you want, the poisson teschner invers inversion kernel. So now is um, one key move that I need to do. Then I will have written down the model uh, and I will tell you how this relates to, to uh, uh, discrete geometry and then I think we'll wrap it up because I'm already threatening to go too much over time. Okay, so now, um, so now the idea is that um, let us think as this as some equation which is of the form m i1, i2, i3, i4, is equal to zero um, for external, so, so these are the external states for the external states um, I1 up to I4. And one way that I can uh, impose this on my matrix model of the CFT data is by simply saying that I integrate over my delta IJs and delta C i j k is with an a priori flat measure, as we did before, but I add e to the minus um, some large number times m i 1 i 2 i 3 i 4 um, squared, so summing over all of the indices, of course, and I integrate over d p s, which is the open index that I need to integrate over. And A is now, for now, is a large coefficient. Okay, what is this saying? This is saying that the um, uh, predominant contribution to this random matrix distribution comes from, uh, comes from uh, 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 solutions that satisfy this crossing equation uh, approximately where the approximate satisfaction has to do with the size of this coefficient, okay? But I am sampling over elements of the ensemble which don't exactly satisfy them. But then now we can look at the moments of the distribution of the crossing equation and see to what extent it's satisfied. Okay, now this is, by the way, Sorry, only one part question. of the potential. Uh, is there a reason why, why not um, imposing a delta function with a Lagrange multiplier? Why I think considering you could, approximate I think you could solutions? Also do it with a, I think you could also do it with a Lagrange multiplier. Uh, you, you don't want to, however, at this point, impose it exactly, right? Because if you impose it exactly, you're back to having something like a CFT, at least uh, at the level of this Virasoro crossing constraint. Yes. Is there some reason not to consider exact CFTs and instead yes, allow because, for Yes, because uh, you don't know how to average over exact CFTs. You know, they don't actually have, uh, uh, you know, the generic CFT won't have a flat direction that you can actually average over. You think that the crossing equation would localize on some point, not on some region that you can actually average over. Perhaps so, there are many points and you average. Yeah, maybe, maybe there are many points. So then that's, that's the question actually. And if we write down this model, 
Um, and there are the other potential terms which come from, as I said, modular crossing invariance, okay, which I'm not writing now in view of time. But if you take all the, the limits, uh, naively that these coefficients go to infinity, you think you land on solutions to the bootstrap equations, exact solutions, okay? But unlike in the usual bootstrap, you would still sum over every single solution. So that might be, for example, a naive large n limit of this, of this model. Okay? Now let me write um, the potential. So this is just part one part of the potential. So, so we have now some V, uh, which we could call four point. And if I write it out, it is of the following form. Okay? It's of the form, let me just uh, write it once, and then I can draw some pictures. I1, I2, P, C star, I, I, Q, C star, I2, I3, Q, times the 6J symbol of Virasora. And it's P, Q, 1, 2, 3, 4. And this sum is a sum prime because I sum over all, only the heavy operators in the black hole spectrum, which if you're heading for pure gravity, you would say that um, you have just the identity over all the high energy states. So the average here is only over those high energy micro over states which have h, h bar, greater than C minus one over 24, to be technical. Now, what is this? Okay, so um, would be nice to have four colors now. And that's the last thing I want to say. I hope that's okay. Yeah. Um, very good. Hopefully they are distinguishable. Yes. Okay, so um, we have C in blue, C in red. Oh. C in green, sorry, this was purple, and C in blue. And what we do is we, we now draw a triangle for each of these OPE coefficients and we label the edges. So each edge has one Virasoro representation on it, so this one will have a representation one, two, and P. And it shares an edge with the red tr triangle so let's do it like this. It shares the edge P. This shares an edge with the green triangle. Okay, I will write the labels later. And then, then there is the blue triangle here. That's the last face of this tetrahedron. Okay, so, well, I guess um, I might mess this up, but so we have the blue one was one, two, P. So the red one has P, and then I have three, four. The index four is shared with the green one. So this one must be then four, right? Four, and then two, four. Um, this was the green one. So the remaining index on the green one is the index Q. Okay, and, and you can fill in the other indices on the back triangle, because if I draw them, I'm just gonna make a dog's breakfast of this. So this is now a vertex of a tensor model, and this vertex is a tetrahedron. However, this model also contains a quadratic term in C, which basically comes from the identity propagating, making two of these OPE coefficients to be equal to one, and this gives a particular contraction of the 6J symbol. So I also have a propagator in this model which glues two triangles. Okay, so it would glue the edges, okay, maybe glue like this, like this and this, glue these two triangles. And this propagator comes out to be exactly the formula that, so these people wrote down a Gaussian model, okay? So in our, in our language, that Gaussian term would be the propagator. 
and they called their, their, prop, their, their Gaussian thing, which we call a propagator, the C0 formula. The C0, C0 formula because, again, these Liouville uh, people that worked out many of the details of Liouville theory as we use it today, Ponceau and Teschner, uh, they, they use the, that notation. So in other words, the graphs of this will be three simplices. Um, that glue triangles, edges, and tetrahedra along, uh, so along vertices of tetrahedra. So this is actually what people call a version of simplicial 3D gravity. But what is different to what people have done in the past with simplicial 3D gravity, so maybe one name, uh, Bulatov, um, and also people like um, Jan Ambjörn and Renate Loll who have worked on this. Okay, so this is now the, the discrete version of a three-dimensional uh, tetra tetrahedronization of three-dimensional Euclidean manifolds. And in the same sense that I started with the matrix, this tensor model integrates over all configurations. And of course now the idea is that you take some double scaling limit in the same sense to, to get actually some continuum path angle of three-dimensional Euclidean quantum gravity. So I'll stop here because I'm already one minute over time. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Okay, there will be more time uh, even after lunch for questions, but perhaps if there are some urgent questions now. Uh, a quick question. You are imposing the um, crossing symmetry, but you're not imposing modular invariance, right? I am. I just told you uh, that there are also terms from modular invariance, which I'm not actually writing down in view right. of time. But one, one consequence this will have, for example, so you can do this, you can play a similar game. There is another inversion kernel. And the identity part of that, which here gave us the propagator, it imposes that on average the spectrum is Cardi. Right. So the, these are constraints on the conformal dimension, right? Um, I don't think, uh, I mean, there are constraints on the conformal dimensions, but they don't constrain individual conformal dimensions. But for example, the density of conformal dimensions asymptotically behaves like Cardi. Yeah. Not all possible set of conformal dimension would work in this, in this integral. Because from the constraints you wrote, uh, it seems you are integrating over all possible conformal dimensions. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand your point. Maybe we should talk offline. Okay. I mean, as I said, there are constraints, but those are the usual constraints that you get from a modularity, like Cardi and so on. Maybe we can take one more question before the break. Any? You want to take A infinity, or is it like, uh, I don't know. N or? Well, that's, that's the, uh, so we, we don't yet understand everything about these classes of models, but the idea that we have at the moment is that you want to take some kind of double scaling limit, so you can't just take it naively to infinity. So what actually you, you, you do is that, um, and this is again very parallel to what is in this uh, rather large uh, work, uh, thanks to some very powerful collaborators, um, so, so this is like a half double scaled version of the model that I wrote here. So what you need to do is you need to step back and you need to actually uh, um, write a properly non-double scaled version which involves Q deforming these objects. And then uh, uh, once, well, we do this very explicitly in this paper. We, we can talk about it. The, um, the quantum 6J symbol is already Q deformed. Do you want to additionally Q deform that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so maybe let's thank now Julian for his beautiful series of lectures.